Squill Boys, TGG and Bids. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, hello, my beautifuls. Welcome back to another Squill Boys, TGG and Bids video. It has been a long time since I've done my Nintendo Direct reaction. And thank you for the latest support. We're almost at 100 subscribers. And I'm, <laughs> I kind of want to do this as a hundred thousand, a hundred subscribers special, but, uh, but, uh, who cares? I'll, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm, uh, <laughs> uh, I'll just, uh, uh, a normal video will suffice for now. Today, as you saw by the title of the video, we are going to be doing something that I should have frankly done when I first saw this movie, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Now, if you haven't recalled, I hyped up this movie to be a great, a very great movie. However, sadly, when I saw it, it was a, a resounding meh. Basically, this is also kind of like a quick review on the movie. It's a nice 6 out of 10. It's not the worst the MCU's been. I've seen worse. But, really, I feel like that this is just an okay movie. I do think the first two movies were better in comparison. And to those who say that the, that the second one is a terrible movie, then you are lying to yourselves. But anyways, um, uh, let's uh, let's get into the to the meat and bones of it all, and uh, really, nothing can possibly go wrong now, right? Right? Oh. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, as you can see. We're not going to talk about that, really. This is a family-friendly kids' channel. Okay, but in all seriousness, you saw the title of the video. You know what we're doing. Quantumania was basically kind of boring, so I'll highlight the things I didn't like along with this, along the way of this rewrite. And let's fix Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, shall we? But a few ground rules shall be set before we embark on this journey. Number one, I'm, I must use the pre-existing, some, at least some of the pre-existing Jeff Loveness uh, material, even though that he completely sabotaged the script and it feels like a Rick and Morty episode. Can we just all agree with that? Uh, rule number two, I have no adding any additional characters that aren't related to the Ant-Man cast in some way, shape, or form. This is including comics. And three, I can't go over the top with it. So anyway, with those rules set, let's begin with the first thing we need to do before we get into the first act. Shall we get to the characters? Yes, we shall. Yeah, we got a slideshow now. I'm just uh, trying to be the best I can be at this stuff. I mean, like... All right, what are we talking about again? Oh, yeah, right, Quantumania. So, the characters. First, I gotta mention the five that are indeed uh, important, but they could just need, like... They just need, like, little synopsis. And that is Scott, Hope, Hank... 
Janet, and Kang. Yeah. Okay. Let's get to the basics. Scott needs a visible arc here. In the movie, he has somewhat of an arc, but he doesn't really, you know, go through any changes. It's just... Bleh. And he kind of just stays the same guy, but... But... Little bit changed, but not all the way. Uh, so, at the beginning of the movie, it was proposed... I think I could propose a counter-subject to this. And that is, just make him... Just make the idea of fame get into his head. And, like, in more specific places or not, he will basically downturn this, basically saying that he's retired from the superhero life, he just wants to be Scott Lang, and, uh, and, uh, is not really into any other of his... is not really for... up for... for... An, the superhero gig anymore and and he'll only come out if the battles are really big and they mean a much to him and he'll soon realize that the little battles will um uh even even the little battles do matter and he'll realize that through his daughter hope well she needs an actual purpose in the story she can't just be there just to save everyone she needs to have an actual purpose in a side character arc. Maybe about not letting, not wanting to let go of her family, and well, learning that that her family that that Janet isn't the same woman that she was like thirty years ago. Also, little side note: in the timeline, this takes place in twenty twenty four. It's like a part of this whole rewrite of the MCU Phase 4 and start of Phase 5. But we'll get to that when we get to that video. Um, uh, Hank, give him more to do. Um, I mean, like, give him more to do than just command a bunch of CGI ants to attack Kang. Give him actual purpose in this story, and then... Uh, and we got Janet. Uh, she needs to explain things about her and Kang sooner. Like, maybe over the course of the story, she reveals tidbits and things about her relationship with Kang. Although, she should be, be able to tell her family what it was like down there in the Quantum Realm. Maybe that could be highlighted in Scott's prologue. And then we have Kang. Possibly the most wasted potential character, considering that they got Jonathan Majors to play him. Um, he didn't really do much. He just loses again and again and again and again. He only wins sometimes, but he, he has more wins than losses. No, no, no. He has more losses than wins. He's kind of like the New York Jets last year. Yeah, suck it, New York Jets fans. I'm going to make a comparison. Plus, they're both wearing green. So, and so, how about make him more of a menace, more serious, and give him more dubs than losses? I'll, this will come back to bite us later. But then we get to what, in my opinion, are the two biggest wasted potential characters in this story. We'll get to minor characters in a bit, but first up. Cassie Lang, a.k.a. Stature. It's no secret that that they just... Well, they ca they recasted Emma Furman. Well, well, to put this in a way that makes sense. They went from Emma Furman to Catherine Newton. That should be like a step up in quality, but she just turns out to be this somewhat unlikable, likable mess. And, well, um, it explains itself. Well, you gotta make her a more likable character. And in my opinion, the secret protagonist. A great example of this is Rocket Raccoon. 
His progression throughout James Gunn's Guardians trilogy is probably one of the greatest character arcs I've ever seen in my life. And and even Mr. Gunn himself admitted that, yeah, Rocket's the secret protagonist in this, of the Guardians trilogy. This is more evident in Guardians 3, which coincidentally is a three film, and I enjoyed better than this. So, also, yeah. Also, relatability is important. She's a teenager. Most of the movie-going audience is uh, around the age of 20 to 10, or around that teenage age. They usually be. Also, big missed opportunity in my opinion, but they should have gave her the powers from the comics because, like, there's something more special about Cassie being the only, like, Pim, Pim Particle based user that that doesn't need a suit she just well it naturally occurs to her. so for those of you who don't know what the, about the comics which of course you don't i mean like if you're just a casual moviegoer well cassie basically was exposed to pin particles at a young age and so those have uh re-emerged and uh it's now based on her emotions on uh basically if she's sad well <laughs> she'll she'll be really really small she's a small girl but you pe you pee her off you give her the middle finger or or you or you or you destroy or you attack someone near and dear to her like her father she get mad grow really big and and what's worse than a teenage than an angry teenage girl? A fifty foot angry teenage girl. And trust me, that is more powerful than well anything. Also, she she lacks real flaws, so establish flaws within the character because that's what makes a character good, because then they learn to well anyways. Also, suit, as you can see right here. Make the suit more comic accurate. I can have a bit of hints of purple in there, but the red suit to honor her father is, I mean, like, come on. It's too iconic. It's, like, striking. All right. Also, when the time comes, she will stand up to the occasion and be, well, the little guy that Scott mentioned Scott mentioned is in his book. She will fight the, the fight that Scott... She will fight the fight, and uh, you'll see that later in the script. But now it's time to get to my most wasted character. Well, well, in my opinion, the most wasted character. Darren Cross, a.k.a. not MODOK. He does not look like... He does not act like MODOK. He does not look like MODOK. Therefore, he is not MODOK. Even though he, he is a giant floating head with comically tiny arms and tiny legs and a somewhat dummy thick butt cheeks seriously why one of my first things don't call him modok call him something else cuz we want to save modok for later like maybe a fourth ant-man movie because most people's complaints was that modok should have been the main villain of ant-man 3 he fits that goofy, fun feeling uh, style of the movies, and I feel like that was that is like, of course, and like it could be like a Loki situation where he goes back to Kang and like says it failed. Okay, another thing, and this is just like another thing on the design part. His design needs to be more inspired by his yellow jacket costume, like. It needs to be more inspired by this than look more like Modok. Because, like... And you can give him, like, a new creative name, like, a new creative acronym that, like, stands for, like... For, like... Like, like something related to a yellow jacket. Or maybe he could just be called Yellow Jacket. Also, don't waste his scream time. And also, maybe even give him a... a a progressive redemption arc. If you don't know what I mean, 
I'll talk about it in some of these PowerPoints over the slideshow. So really, that's all the major characters I want to cover. So now we get to the side characters. The others, I mean, like, where was he? Where was he? Where was we? Where was he when we needed him? Luis, it, it's just not an Ant-Man movie without Luis or for the fact Kurt. Now, David Desmulchen did return in this movie, but he played Veb. And I can basically say that I liked Kurt more than Veb. I don't know why, but it's just that the holes joke, it, it, it was kind of weird. Honestly, it made me think of something else. <sighs> Anyways, they would return in a minor role and actually be, and actually help get the quantum, get get Scott and gang out of the quantum realm. And of course, it wouldn't be an anime movie if we didn't get one of Luis's classic. Uh, Uh, big talk stories. And this is before, like, Scott's gonna die and, like, all that stuff, but it's like... Okay. And it's, like, a short, but make it quick. Also, Dentora and the Quantum People. This is where mo I see that people, like, throw most of the hate towards uh, the actor who... The actress... Sorry, actress that plays Gentora. And I can get why. Because it portrays the strong female archetype where no real development. She's just a strong female that has political views. Uh, it's been done to death a million times in the MCU. Give me something new. So, also, you don't really care for the quantum people really that much. Like, like you wasted another good actor another good candidate for Reed Richards in the MCU. Like, why? And, uh... And, uh... And, uh... Just give the character... Like, give us something to care about with these characters. Like, actually make us care about these side characters. So that way, when they get hurt or are involved in an action sequence are, well, we actually care about them. And, uh, yeah, that's really my fix for them, but... Also, where where's pe where's Cassie's mom? I know that the actress was too much to pay for, and like, she was busy or something like that, but please, just make a return for, like a, like, a small portions of the movie, and we'll be chill. We'll be chill, Mr. Reed. And finally, um, just Bill Foster. I just want to get like a checkup on him, like, like, like maybe during Scott's montage, and maybe he also helps Scott and Gang get out of the quantum realm. I mean, like, yet again, yet again, it's you know, something. And then etc. Like other other characters. Like I didn't really want to cover most of them because I didn't want to make this a short video. But anyways. Enough of me blabbering over characters. Let's actually get into Act One of this movie. But before we do, I must I must tell you before we get into the, all this, I'm going by a four act structure. Now the reason why I'm not doing a three act structure is because that this move one of the, one of the other biggest complaints about this movie was that it's kind of short by MCU standards. Like the previous movie, Wakanda Forever, it was like two hours. 40, 47 minutes. Like, somewhere around that. This movie was only two hours and five minutes, and if you discard the credits, that's barely pushing out of the two-hour mark. And I feel like that if you're going to tell a big story, you got to have a big runtime. So maybe around that two and a half hour or two and three quarters of an hour. Two hours and a... Uh, 45 minutes, like, somewhere around that. And and that gives us, like, some time. Like, plenty of time. But, now let's get... Now, with all of that clarified, let's get into what I 
fixed, replaced, you know, but there's one more thing we're going to have to tackle before we get, when we get to act, when we get into act two and you'll see why in a bit, but for now, act one, transition powers, activate. The beginning of the movie, otherwise known as act one. Even after I informed you that we were going to the beginning of the movie. Well, Act 1, everybody. Pretty sure this is, like, the most straightforward act. Act 1 is, well, Act 1. And really, it's the most simplistic act of them all. And, and I really... And I really wish that, well... Oh, well, 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 I want to step down. Let's see for yourself, my plate, please. Well, first of all, um, the film starts relatively the same. Scott Lang opens with the narration of his book. See how things been going. Characterize our main characters. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, really, uh, things go the same. Cassie gets picked up from jail. She just is like trying to like be like, hey, I'm in a suit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Same things. Yada, yada, yada. They go over to Janet's house for dinner to have dinner with the pizza pie. The pizza pie. <laughs> you know, pizza, pasta, put it in a box, bring it here and Put it on the lock. Alrighty, but aside from that, they, they just talk about stuff, you know. And Scott says some things that he wish he wouldn't have said. And he gets a call from Louise and Kerr saying that they need to do something, and it's about the coal company, about XCON, and, you know, it's like, it's about another one of them. Another one of them big pitches. Another one of them big pitches. And he says they could they could come over to his house. And, uh, well, do so. Well, well, then, of course, they talk out over things, you know. And, uh, Scott, uh, so then, um, after dinner, they go, he, he goes to find Cassie downstairs in the basement, showing off everyone her new quantum transmitter. And Scott is impressed. And... He says, maybe I'll put this in a sequel book. Put this all in a sequel book. Everyone groans around him. Everyone groans around him. But the idea of posting a set, a second, a second book. But what was it going to be called? Well, yeah, well... I don't know. That would be up to the, to the fictional character of Scott Lang to figure out. Anyways, they send a signal down to the quantum realm. Janet, of course, uh, Janet warns them. And soon then, it turns on. Everyone gets sucked in. However, Peggy hears the ruckus. Luis and Kurt also hear it once they get in. They go down and says to the basement. Well, while this is all happening. Cassie tells Scott how, exactly how to shut off the portal, and and Scott gives this information when Luis and Kirk come downstairs. They shut up. So, Scott, Scott gets sucked in, going after Cassie, and of course, the call to the adventure begins. Some other things that I didn't mention here is that they is that we would still be separated into the groups. Janet. Janet, Hope, and Hank, and uh, Scott and Cassie, and uh, they would, uh, and of course they would have that, th that same conversation about camping. Janet, of course, Hope would, of course, be amused at the, this, the sights and sounds of the quantum realm. And really, we just got to talk about the quantum realm in general. But let's get into Act Two because that's what I. Because, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to about the sets. 
What about the sets? And also, the meat and bones of this movie. Act 2 and the midpoint. Practical monsters and a deal with the devil. Pretty sure you're not going to be surprised. Yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 it's no secret that the CGI in this movie is AM. Or ASS. AS. But I don't say that in a mean way, spirited way. I say that in a way saying that it looks t- that I don't blame the VFX artists. I blame the studio because, well, they rushed it. They rushed the VFX when it could have been something glorious. So, remember what I was talking about earlier with the hope of admiring the quantum realm? Well, I want it to be an actual set. Kind of like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids kind of thing. And, uh, make it larger than life and very vast. All the sets should be at least somewhat practical in a somewhat way. Speaking of practical usage, yeah, I feel like that Marvel should have hired Stan Winston Studios, Stan Winston School, or Legacy Effects, whatever the hell they're called today, and ILM to do practical and visual effects, and can even include, and, well... These two studios are known for a lot, so I think they'd be able to include some of their uh, more notable works as cameos. And I feel like this is also me- I need to mention this, but when when Hope and Hank get and Janet get their disguise, put on their disguises, and go to the quantum realm and all that that sort of shtick, Janet could describe it as like a cross. The quantum realm is a crossroads of the multiverse, and and it could be followed by some pretty cool cameos from uh, practical monsters that uh, that uh, were actually in some of Stan Winston's most notable movies, like Alien, like the Alien franchise, the, ter- the first two Terminator movies, the Predator series, and of course, Jurassic Park. Wouldn't mind if there were some, some, also some other ILM creations, like maybe The Matrix. But ILM would handle the CGI along with the Marvel VFX artists because I feel like it would be really cool. But another really cool thing that would be really cool is if it also referenced a a past thing that never happened. Yes, what you see before you is Stan Goji. And most of these guys would actually most of these guys would actually play small roles anyways. So I wouldn't mind if we would have finally gotten a a man in a suit, Godzilla, Stan Goji, and well, come on, this design is cool. And and if you want me to do a what if we got Godzilla '94 video where I attempt to try and revive this uh, actually pretty good Godzilla movie concept, well. Hit the subscribe button and considering joining. Joining. Mm, yes. Very, very, very good. That is very good. And also, maybe share this video with a friend. And that's it for your shameless plug. But anyways, I would love to have more practical effects than CGI. It just makes it more authentic and could actually nominate it for best VFX, considering that, that Marvel VF having practical effects in their movies has become all the more rare nowadays. And on a similar note, I would have all all the fight scenes and action choreography it'd be real. And and maybe you could take some inspiration from Kung Fu Panda, but really that's it for the whole VFX for the whole SFX SFX side. So, let's get back to the story. Act 2. Now, Scott and Cassie meet the Quantum People, a.k.a. the Rebellion. The Rebellion. They have... There. And, of course, they have many moments where they come... Where they bond. They have... They connect, you know. You know, you know something that will actually make their characters actually pretty useful. and Or not. Maybe even Gentor and Cassie form a small little... A small little friend... Blossom of friendship. And... And, uh, and, uh, Jintor gives Cassie something special that will come in handy later. And, uh, and, and the whole camping joke would be actually resolved, be resolved. 
and and uh really also the whole the whole uh, Janet and Hope Hope and Hank subplot they'd be at the at the point where they'd be they'd be flying on that manta ray which would make a pretty cool animatronic just saying and and meet the all meet it at the spaceport meet it at the spaceport where all those cameos i mentioned earlier come in and uh then really we cut back to Scott, to to our our dynamic lang duo where uh they are uh getting they're gun they're getting caught comfy you know nothing's going wrong it's like they don't have a care in the world but then bum 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 Kang's forces come in and a newly improved Darren attacks the camp ending with Scott and Cassie being kidnapped it's a mostly play out the same but but Darren would not say he is Modoc okay but but remember we have to keep up with uh Janet and Janet and the others. So, meanwhile, Janet, and this is going to be like progressive over the story, but Janet tells her back, tells her about her her time in the quantum realm that she didn't really want to share about because she she thought it would get her into trouble. So she shares her dark past with Kang the with with Kang the Conqueror, or as she called him, Nate. This is obviously a reference to the fact that Kang is just future Nathaniel Rich is just Kang's real name is Nathaniel Richards and keep that name in mind because it's going to be very important later anyways let's actually uh get to Kang's deal you know dealing with the devil he's an eye he has an eye for a bargain you know so we got to the prison scene and they joke around about being in the slammer being thrown in the slammer and then, of course, we get Mr. Majors himself, Kang the Conqueror, in all his glory. The encountering scene goes pretty much somewhat the same, but but here's what's different. It's the deal. You see, Kang offers Scott offers Scott a deal to help them both out. Since Kang has traveled the multiverse, he knows some things about Scott, like his love for his daughter and the five years that he missed with her. That he missed with her. Just pretend that it says her right there, because, like, I I really just forgot to do spell checks and all that stuff. But, of course, of course, Darren tries to interject, saying, saying, no, they shouldn't be helping us. Of course, Kang is, is like, never mind, never mind your friend over there. The quantum realm envi- the environment of the quantum realm has gotten to his head, has gotten to his head, and of course that make for a great joke. And of course Scott would would laugh. And of course Kang would, and of course silence would, silence would once again grow when Kang when Kang says enough. Of course, Kang offers Scott a. A bargain. If he helps him steal a, a power source, a battery or quantum generator, as we're going to call it, being guarded from him by the TVA because they found it apparently, then if he if he steals it from them, then and only then. Kang will give Scott the five years of the blip that he w- was gone back to him to spend more time with a younger Cassie. It's a real deal. Of course, Scott being naive, Kang knows Scott is naive. So so obviously, so obviously Scott does a little bit of com- contemplating, but eventually he says yes. But Cassie is kind of kind of off putted by Kang's deal. And senses something fishy going on. But otherwise, Kang releases Scott from his prison and 
and he tells two guards to escort Cassie to another part of the bill to another part of the building. Of course, they have to prepare for the heist. So yeah, if you couldn't tell, this is sort of recycling the heist element of the origin of the of the first two Ant-Man movies because I feel like it was kind of missing from this one. And you're, he's not really stealing the quantum generator from anyone in the the first in the original movie that we got. So I decided to add the TVA in there and really come on. It furthers the Loki connection. But anyways, why not why don't we get a sneak peek at Kang's villainy through well, the eyes of a young the eyes of one Cassie Lang. So, when the deal is done and the bargain and the bargain is made, and the bargain is made, like I said, Cassie's being escorted to another part of Kang's of Kang's of Kang's, well, we'll just call it castle. Or But she messily she she takes out the guards, although in a very messy way, in a similar way she does in the final battle, where she uses PIM discs. But 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 she she shrinks it she shrinks both of them down. Of course when more guard when more guards come she shrinks she shrinks down to to, to ant size and and ends up finding herself in Kang's throne room. Where we see him looking at a looking at a at a hologram of something. We only hear screams, explosions, and and mysterious people talking. Cassie is mortified by by this, and of course, a shock expression on Cassie's face. Of course, of course, this would give us the hints that Kang, that something is afoot, and Kang isn't what he seems. Also, by the way, artwork by Art of Time Travel. It depicts Kang bodying the entire Avengers, and I love it. And well, pretty much that will be what we see later in the movie. Wink, wink. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Anyways, we catch up with Janet, Hank, and Hope. Because, well, they're in this movie too, right? So, a quick reunion. If you cannot tell, Janet and the group enter the secret bar. And Janet says that there could be someone here that could help them. Of course, this is this is Lloyd Krylar. And of course, you know what I'm going to say here. Things mostly play out the same. Krylar, Krylar tries to kidnap them. Krylar tries to kidnap them. They steal. They get into. They get into a random ship and and fly away. Of course, Janet feeling reluctant for attacking her best friend. Now having escaped and and far away from from any of Kang's forces, able uh, being in a place where they cannot track them. Janet decides to tell the rest of the story about her about her life with Kang in the quantum realm. And uh, and I and it doesn't say it on the presentation because I want, well, I wanted me to explain this truly from the heart of what I would have felt like. So really, the movie depicts it in a way that that's kind of serious, like and also loving. And no, I'm not gonna make them have sex in the quantum realm. This this is a PG-13 Marvel movie, even though Eternals showed the first naked sex in the MCU. I'm not showing it here because I'm not a pervert like y'alls. But they were known as friends, you know. They bonded, maybe even lovers. But Janet never really goes into that. So then, of course, over this time they were fixing Kang's time chair, and of course, once they fixed it. Now, of course, the time chair is linked to his memories, so when Janet touches the power core, she then saw him for what he truly was. For what he truly was. 
We see what Cassie saw in the before. Of course, building suspension. Of course, of course, there kind of is the problem. There was the problem of like we don't see Kang taking out these these Avenger variants and also conquering. Like, you know, if he's gonna be Kang the Conqueror, might as well give him a ways to conquer. To conquer. Otherwise, he's just as good as his knockoff version, Prince Awi the Conqueror from SNL, which coincidentally he played. But of course, mostly, and of course, this ends in Janet just imploding the the time tears source of power, the quantum battery. Of course, then this led down. This led Kang down the path of becoming a tyrannical leader over the quantum realm. Of course, Janet tried to fight off Kang with all her might, but some of her... But even though she... And she eventually formed the Rebellion. She met... She met Quaz. She met... She met Jentora. They became good friends. And of course, then, they got separated after... After Kang, after a big attack that Kang, Kang did, and of course, then you know what, what what goes on from here. Janet, Janet gets rescued by her husband Hank. They get re, they get reunited, and well, that's it. Of course, of course, Hope consoles with Jan, with her mother, and of course, the, and of course, well. Yeah, you know how it goes if you've seen the movie. Well, of course, it makes it all the more urgent to find Scott, Scott, and Cassie because we now know that Kang is a brutal liar, but Scott doesn't know it. This is kind of like Scar manipulating Simba into thinking that he's the good guy when people really know, oh, oh crap, he's the bad guy. So really, it'll be a twist to the character not to us and the characters. So now we go to the day of the heist. After we we have caught up with with Janet and the others, the very next day is the is is heist day for Scott. Scott is escorted by Kang escorts Scott and also followed by Darren and some of Kang's men, as well as as Cassie, because she because she decided because well it's a scene that I really didn't want to explain. But they it's just Scott alone that has to do this. He's given instructions by Kang and Darren on how to retrieve the power core. And of course, inform him that the t- that when that when the power core was imploded, imploded up, the TVA took notice of it and and built a base of operations in the quantum realm. So of course, Scott's gotta Scott's gotta get get through to, gets through the TV trust has to get through the TVA and then has to has to. Get inside the power core. However, a a probability storm, a probability storm, is on the verge. So Scott has to get in and get out quickly. So of course the heist starts, and Scott has, and of course Scott struggles with the TVA agents, but ultimately does get past them and goes into the to the power source. Gets into the power source and and dives deep inside the quantum realm. Dives deep inside and then sees the blown up generator while also, also encountering clones of himself. This eventually leads to the same scene that we get in the movie. Where the Scots make a make an ant make an ant formation out of their love for Cassie, and and of course 
Janet. Janet finds. And of course, then Janet rescues Scott from the from the probability storm. They get they shrink the core back down. The storm passes. And the storm passes. And the storm passes. Basically, then we get to the whole well <laughs> Kang Kang's lie scene or Kang's betrayal or whatever you want to, or whatever you want to call it. So of course, after the whole heist is over and the core is back to normal, Kang and his men appear to exchange and as Scott grabs the core and is ready to exchange ends, just as just as Hope and and Janet rush in and urge him to not give him the core, because Kang is a filthy liar. He will conquer the multiverse and he will conquer the multiverse and possibly and possibly even and possibly even possibly even destroying the fabric of time and reality as as we knew it. However, Scott doesn't believe this and says that that he could give us a, that he could give me a second chance with my daughter. And of course, this goes into a whole debate. And so in an act of defiance, Scott tosses the power core over to Kang. And then Scott says, All right. I held up my end now. 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 Send me back five years. Kang, of course, this is when Scott realizes that the deal was just all a lie. Was just all a lie. And Scott says that's so stereotypical of bad guys that why didn't I see that coming? Because I didn't see that coming. And of course, well, they roll their eyes in a, knowing that Scott is not the brightest bulb in the box. But of course, Scott then realizes that, that his daughter Cassie is still there, and he has to go get her. So he and Hope try to go through the portal that came, 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 came through, but he knocks them aside like flies. Meanwhile, Hank is gets a brutal, a brutal, Hank gets a brutal, you missed me from Darren, and you missed me from Darren, and and presumably kills him, but is saved by his aunts that were sent down there because Cassie was testing it, testing the, when Cassie was testing, and, however, they were smart aunt, they were smart aunts. So then, Janet gets frozen in, in place, and, and gets taken, taken away by Kang. He has time powers, after all, so he obviously freezes Janet in place. He's freezing Janet in place. And so, well, you know what happens next. Yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. So then, Kang gets ready to, to take off across the multiverse and he will make Janet watch for, watch, watch well. He'll basically start with her universe and then, and then go to others. And she will watch every being in that universe suffer in the most painful ways possible. And every way will be, he knows, will be, will be, excruciating mindless pain of course cassie would not be detained for long and 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 taking her father's advice from earlier beats all the guards and, and tries to find a way out of course this leads to darren chasing her and However, before that, Cassie frees the rubble, 
the quantum rebel rebels from their prisons and and gets ready for a third act battle that will possibly seal the movie's fate. But is it truly the third act? Or are we just tripping again? We'll see. In time. Act 3. A final battle fake out and Cassie's secret. If this video is going to be an hour long, but that's what it's going to be when, it's com when it comes to these rewrites. Oh boy. Anyways, uh, Act 3, everybody. So, Hank and Co. go to the Conqueror to challenge them and even gather up some of the rebellion that hasn't been captured yet. Of course, most of the scene plays out the same. However, Cassie even try. However, well, I want the encounter, the chase between Cassie and Modoc to have some dialogue and banter between it. And really, well. And, well, really. Well, taunt. And then at one point, Modoc will just taunt her with everything. And then she gets angry. She gets really big. And then. Darren is surprised. And then she gets real big. And then she she throws hands with him and swings him by by a cable wires like a so long gay Bowser. And of course then tells Darren that that it's not too late to, to change sides. And really, Darren says, But can't but the conqueror has given me purpose or something like that. And Cassie says, Has he really given you purpose? Or are you just a puppet? That, or are you just a puppet of a greater scheme? This sinks in with Modoc. This sinks in for Modoc. And well, this will come to come to front to a front later once we uh, get to the final act and all that stuff. Anyways, uh, also the whole bit where Scott acts like Godzilla. I feel like that you can actually have uh, Paul Rudd put on the Ant-Man suit and actually destroy some miniatures that ILM can cook up. Can cook up. I mean, like, come on, they worked on the Star Wars trilogy, and they worked on some of the prequels, and there were some miniatures in them, so why not? And of course, it'd be a big help for the VFX team, and plus, it could even combine the volume. Mmm, yes, very good, yes. And then all things. And of course, they seemingly beat Kang after... After he is... After the rebellion holds off some time and seems to have gotten things all under control. And of course, they get... They hurry back to the open portal. <sighs> the open portal to the open portal that well I'm a that Kang was opening and of course Janet modified it to be well open and all that stuff but anyways they open the portal all seems good Louise catches us up on how on how he was be able able to find them and all that stuff you know like one of his short little one of the you know the thing that anime movies are no, most known for and of course, he gets to make it quick, and then of course, and of course, it's a it's a mad dash for Scott, it's for Scott and the gang, for Scott and the gang, and, and Cassie and soon then Cassie, Scott share a little bit of a moment, but then he sees something behind her, and it's Kang pushes her pushes her through the portal and and closes it shut. And closes it shut. And closes it shut. Kang says, You made a foolish decision, Lang. You. And. Or. Or and. You really think you're gonna win. And then, of course, we get that trailer line. I don't have to win. We just both have to lose. And of course, this leads to Scott's death. No surprise. I literally wanted this to happen in the movie. 
it, it would basically put some weight, gratitude onto it. And also, wouldn't be the first time that a that a that a Disney dad has died. Am I right? Am I right? Yeah. So of course, Scott Scott puts up a valiant fight, and we even hear through the comms of the brutal massacring that's going on. Hope, of course, has to get the portal open. While Cassie's trying to get it open, Scott says, no, don't. You'll just let him through. Of course, we get a heart-touching speech from Scott. As, as well, he hears, he's, he's speaking in particular from his daughter, well, to his daughter, and, and says that, says that, and says, well, I enjoyed the time we had, and it made me realize that, that, well, that I should, that, well, I should have listened to you in the first place. And, well, it's something along the lines of that. It's like a moving speech. And, of course, I think the last words that Scott should say are, so long, Peanut. And that would punch in the heart because that's something that he always calls, Cat always, has always called Cassie from the very beginning, Peanut. And then the calm flat lines. We don't know what happens next, but he's dead. The previous Ant-Man, or just Ant-Man in general, is gone. This is too much for not even Cassie to handle. But we'll get to that in Act 4. And what I've cooked up, I think, can be the definitive ending to Ant-Man and the Wasp. Quantumania, baby. So, let's get to it, shall we? And end this. Wow. The final act. A satisfying ending. And the Young Avengers. Here we go. The moment you've all been waiting for. Act 4. Scott's just been killed. Cassie is sad. And speaking of Cassie. Basically, Cassie, now. Who had just heard her, bro her father get brutally massacred by Kang the Conqueror. She runs upstairs. Cry. Run runs upstairs. Crying. The rest of the group is feeling sad for her. As Scott was somewhat of a of a mentor to her. She was her father. So Janet decides to go upstairs to find Cassie. But she finds out she's ant sized. And she's not and she didn't use the suit. But she is moping. Of course, Janet gives her an inch. Of course, Janet talks it out with Cassie, and, and then this moves into a motivational speech that is similar to what Cassie actually said to uh, Scott in 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 the previous movie, which would be a nice way of using the Ant Man formula. After that, Cassie grows back to normal size. Oh, and also small detail. Due to also the particles having an effect on her, she will turn slowly from from brown to blonde. From brown to blonde. Starting with the tips and going all the way. Uh, and then the end of the movie, she will be a full blonde. In a, and then the pig. And then of course, well, you get the idea. But, <clears throat> of course, Cassie, Cassie, inspired by Janet's Janet's words decides that she is going to take on Kang the Conqueror, and she is gonna, and of course, avenge her father. No pun intended. Cut to a montage where she is getting ready to go back to the quantum realm. Hank and Janet make a suit that will accommodate her new powers, her new powers, and 
And basically, they want to go... They originally want to go in the purple direction, but Cassie objects and says that she wants to wants it to be red and black, just like her father's, just like the Ant-Man, just like her father. It was a way to honor her. It was a way to honor her father. <sighs> also, made a little edit. Also, during this montage, she will call a special someone for backup, just in case. Then, then, once the once the portal is all up and ready, they locate the the surviving rebels, and and Cassie. And soon, then we basically cut back to cut back to Kang to Kang's fortress, the multiverse engine, and the time and his time chair are all are all repaired, all repaired. Modok decides to question Kang, although doesn't really know what to do. Although, is really scared to, because, well, Kang the Conqueror. I mean, like, I wouldn't be scared if I was talking to Kangers the Conqueror. To Kangers the Conqueror. But, soon they hear giant footsteps. They presume that this is Scott, but he's dead. He can't can't be making those giant footsteps. Scott, of course, K Kang, thinking that it's Scott, yells out, yells out that he's already won or something along the lines of that. But then he sees that he that he's not wearing a helmet and sees that it that it's Cassie in a in a similar colored suit in a similar colored suit but, and she is big, and she's, and she's, well, don't get me demonetized for this. P-I-S-S-S-E-T. -S 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 well, D. Yeah. So, of course, another fight breaks out. This time, things are going in their favor. She's learned very much. Also, forgot to mention this until, up till now, but Kang also would have time-related powers, where it could slow down time, stop time, or reverse time. So, of course, they go through this character moments galore in this. Then, of course, Kang would... Cassie would confront the Conqueror himself. And we would even get a Darren's Redemption moment in some way, shape, or form. I didn't really bother to care. Of course, Ant-Man's daughter and the Conqueror would fight. Cassie would get the upper hand for a little bit, but Kang would soon show her that she she could just be another puny insect, just like her father. Just as about and just as she's about to get she's about to get to get bodied. The surprise guest. It's no surprise that Kate Bishop and Cassie Lang are are friends in the comics, and I feel like it was a missed opportunity to have Kate swoop in and save the day. And basically, since people are unaware of her existence, Kang could just say, who the hell are you? Basically saying what we're all thinking. What we're all thinking. So, of course, the two find a way to beat Kang in a very smart way that he wouldn't know. And soon then, this presumably leads to his death as he falls down a pit without his technology, without nothing basically presuming him dead. The quantum people then cheer and then cheer and 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 basically, well, cheer base and say hurrah because because guess what? The the conqueror is presumably dead and defeated. So of course, they say their goodbyes. We cut to a time skip. It's about it's about a few weeks after the whole Conqueror debacle. And then we hear a voice. Maybe Joe Rogan on his podcast. On a podcast. Interviewing Cassie about her quantum her quantum realm adventures. And also she provides a thought-provoking message. And of course, remarks that, that she'll be ready when... Eve, and even if Kang does come back, she'll be ready. 
hand. And if she does, and if he... And maybe by that time... Well, well, it would end something like that, but she would basically thank her dad for everything. Basically, a response to Scott at the beginning, thanking Cassie. At the end, we see Kang... At the end, we get a jump scare as we see Kang's hand pulling up out of the abyss. We then see him being pulled up by red hex magic. It's the Scarlet Witch! Now, for those of you who don't know, in my Wicked and Speed... In my Wicked and Speed... Uh, how I would write a Wicked and Speed movie video. Um, it should be click in the iCard up above. Somewhere in the top. Somewhere in the top. Don't know where. Left, right. I don't know which one. The art of editing always makes this hard. But anyways. Uh, it would turn... If you... if Of course, that movie, of course, would uh, be really... Of course, I said that that Scar the Scarlet Witch would survive thanks to Kang offering her a deal that if he if she can help if she will stand by his side and help him and help him escape the quantum realm, then he will give her her children back. This also means like screwing up the multiverse, all that stuff, and well, kind of saying all that kind of stuff. But anyways, but anyways, it then. We then see a council of Kangs where, with, with Pharaoh Ramatut and the Supreme Intelligence waiting for him to go at his command. We then see a boy piercing over, and then we cut to black. So yeah, the movie would end on a cliffhanger, on a cliffhanger, because, because of course, Kang's not defeated yet. This would, of course, set him up as for his menacing Kang dynasty. I feel like that the ending was kind of well self-rewarding. Basically, they had they they had their cake and ate it. I don't want that to happen. So instead, I had I had the quantum. I, I instead had Scott die in the third act as a sacrifice. He dies. Cassie takes up the stature mantle. Supposedly defeats Kang. Has a small victory, but but Ka even Cassie full well knows that that she doesn't know if Kang is dead or not. But if he does indeed come back, she says she'll be ready. But of course, we all know that, that Kang is full of surprises. Also, I think that the Scarlet Witch helping him would make a ton of sense, considering that he would have helped her when Mount Wondegore collapsed. When Mount Wondegore collapsed. Of course, that would have been in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. At the end, we... And of course, it would kind of be a way to basically say, hey, Kang's coming back. And it can even say, Kang will return when it cuts to black. But in a more futuristic way, and in the Kang Dynasty font. And it's blue. Anyways, let's talk about the, the post credit scenes. Which... Uh, which actually are very different from the final movie. Okay. So, I'm still going to have the Loki Season 2 tease with Loki and Mobius viewing Victor Timely. Uh, for my sanity's sake, I'm not going to take this out because, one, it actually will... Because, one, it actually would tie into the whole multiverse saga and actually kind of is a cool tease. And, two... I don't want to remove it because if I do, my sister will kill me. So I'm keeping it in here just for my sanity's sake. And I'm just hoping that my sister doesn't tear me to shreds just because I removed it. The second post credit scene would be actually a tease of the Young Avengers. It shows Kate and Cassie at the old Avengers Tower or wherever they would want to be to form a new Avengers base. A young, Avenger, a young Avengers base. And Kate says that she's been wondering if the Avengers would ever come back because, well, they've been sort of in a hiatus. Cassie says that they couldn't possibly form an Avengers team. Of course, she turns around. We see Timothy John May Wiccan and, and Constable Speed. 
or just Billy and Tommy. They basically they they get like a couple lines, and then we hear hear a a familiar voice, followed by a quick shoulder shot of some of of a guy with with blonde hair in red, wearing a red a red suit of armor. This would be an Iron Lad voice cameo. And it would end the movie saying the Avengers will return, but then spray paint, but then the sound of spray paint comes on and it says the young Avengers will return. So yeah, if you don't know, the young Avengers would be teased in this movie. I feel like it would be a great way to do that. And of course, I feel like that that we don't give this team enough credit. And also, and also, guess who the Young Avengers' first opponent was? Kang! So, it kind of makes sense that they, out of out of everyone, would deserve a post-credits mention. Now, of course, this did mean the sacrifice of the Kang, of the Kang, of the Kang Council post credit scene. But I think it's for the better, considering that it was just kind of a weird attempt to make a Kang Super Bowl. I mean, like, literally, it was five days after the big, it was literally five days after the big, the big game. Count them, five. And it just felt kind of weird and just felt like a bunch of CGI stuff. A bunch of CGI just with voices and yelling. It was just a bunch of copied Jonathan Majors out there. So I decided to move it to the ending where we see the Kang, the Council of Kangs. With Pharaoh Ramatut and the Scar and the Scarlet Centurion. However, notice I did not mention Immortus because, well, he's sort of like a anti-hero kind of thing where he bounces between two sides. But, but really, we did it. We rewrote Ant-Man and the Wasp: Quantumania, and I think in a better way. Now, I wanted to mention this as a disclaimer. I'm not saying this in a way that I am just better, infinitely better than than any of the people at Marvel. This is just me saying, here's what I would do with uh, a script. And really, I wanted this movie to be great. We all did. But I think feel like a combination of expectations and also poor management on the end of Marvel and Disney. Well... I feel like this movie, in alternate reality, this movie that I talked about exists. So, maybe one day, maybe one day they'll look upon this and say, eh, that guy had a great idea. Anyways, anyways, let's just uh, go to an outro and recap what we've done to this movie. So, we did it. We finally did it. We fixed Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. What have we learned? Well, we learned that rushed production time can lead to a bad movie. But if a movie is given time to cook in the oven of that which is known as the the production, it will come out as a beautiful pastry that will be enjoyed by millions and millions of people. Everyone may not agree or not, but they'll at least agree that it is a good movie. A movie to enjoy during the cold winter into spring months. I think this movie would have made a decent well, it would have made decent money at the box office. And also, I feel like that it would have not have gotten that 46% on Rotten Tomatoes. Good God. But, I mean, like, I mostly took inspiration from the audio commentary. And I listened to the audio commentary. Yes, I did. I'm that kind of guy. But, really, my words can only do so much. It is you. You. You can change everything. You, the viewer. However, Marvel, 
if you're listening, please hire me. Please hire me because, well, I would definitely love to rewrite Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania for you and make it the definitive version. Thank you and please. Anyways, time for an outro. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to uh, super smash the subscribe button. And don't forget to... To... To crush the like button. Also, give the... Ring that bell. Ring the bell. The bell. The notification bell, that is. And don't forget to share this video with your friends. And if you liked it, why don't you uh, comment down below what your version of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania is. I'd love to hear it. And for now, um, really, you know what I'm going to say next. Long live the Skrills. We'll see you boys next time in another reality. Bye, my broskies.